You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 136 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today, we are discussing seahorses. Ah, back to the ocean. Yes, it's been it's been too long since we've talked about fish. That's true. I think <laughs> coelacanths was probably the last episode, and that was like two years ago. And, you know, I thought the last fish we talked about was pretty weird. So, let's go weird. <laughs> <laughs> this episode, we will look at the group of fish that includes seahorses and their relatives, the Cygnathids. These are a bunch of very strange, odd Weirdly shaped and behaviored fish. We're going to talk about what makes a seahorse a seahorse, what makes them and their cousins unique from other fish, what do we know about their origins, of course, and then fossil record. And we'll look at the interesting studies done on the evolutionary trends, what, how they have just done some strange, strange things and why we think they might have done it. This is a fun topic. I'm always excited to talk about a group that just went, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, off the deep end (laughs) and got bizarre. And boy, did they. This topic was also requested, as all our topics are. We are discussing this because Anna, The Load, and Cheryl wanted to hear about it. Well, thanks. Your wish has come true. (laughs) And boy, what a fun topic it was to research. So we hope you enjoy that discussion. But first, some announcements. And the first announcement is also to shout out some names. As many of you know, we have a Patreon. If you sign up on our Patreon, you get all sorts of extra goodies, bonus news, director's notes, live streams with us, and also your name shouted out if you join at certain levels. And so we would like to welcome our newest patrons, Fran and Tracy. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for your support, and thank you to all of our patrons who support us. And if you're looking for ways to support us, Patreon's a great way. If you're wanting to support the podcast, or us, or just SciComm and education in general, you can support us there. You can also use one-time donation links that we have up and send us stuff in the mail, or just tell us, you know, you think we're neat in (laughs) all the ways. Links for all those options in the episode description. And continuing the note of Patreon, one of the top things we will give to the patrons who give us the most is bonus custom episodes about those people's favorite animal. Yeah, we call them mini episodes. And we happen to have just recently released a batch of mini episodes. We did this a while back around the start of the pandemic times. We gathered up all the mini episodes we had recorded for patrons up until then and put them out for everybody to hear and enjoy. And now that we've recorded a bunch more, we've done it again. So if you'd like to listen to these mini episodes and get little sort of bite-sized discussions about a variety of topics, check it out. It should be in the podcast episodes list. And speaking of ways to support us, we got some cool mail recently. Oh, that's true. We have a physical mailing address now for anybody who wants to send us physical tokens of their appreciation through the snail mail. And we want to give a shout out and thanks to Caleb, who sent us some really cool enamel pins. Very cool. And to Elizabeth, who sent us some wonderful holiday postcards. Yeah, so those are all up on our bulletin boards and walls now, because those they were great. Yeah, thanks. And hey, if you would like to send us physical mail, find the address in the episode description. And with that, we can wrap up announcements and move right on to our first official section, the news. Did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. Remember when we used to do that joke? <laughs> oh, yeah, we did. Didn't That's we? a five year old joke. <laughs> <laughs> We're old. Every episode, we like to discuss some recent science, paleontology, geoscience, evolutionary news, some research that's been put out and has been made its way to science news. This keeps us up to date and it keeps you all up to date. So, David, what's our first news for this episode? I've got some research that asks the question, what was eaten trilobites? Yeah, like what was bothering them? You know, right. What was like what weighing their, them their down? troubles? Yeah. Right, right, right. Cambrian world problems? Yep. Not enough shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, it was a real struggle back then. This is research by Russell Bicknell et al. in the journal known as Paleogeography, Paleoclimatology, and Paleoecology, P3, to its friends. And we will link to an article in the blog post every 
episode comes with a blog post with additional links and info and including links to the news articles. This one will include a link to an article in the New York Times by Rebecca Zombach. Trilobites are the extremely famous arthropods from the Paleozoic era. We did a whole episode about them, episode 82. If you're not familiar with trilobites, they are multi-segmented little bug things that crawled around or sometimes swam around in the ocean. This research focused on trilobite fossils from the Emu Bay Shale in South Australia. This is a site with some exceptional fossil preservation. Specifically, this group was looking for evidence of feeding on trilobites. These are trilobites from the Cambrian period, around 514 million years ago, so shortly after the Cambrian explosion, episode 9. To this end, the researchers examined coprolites, fossilized poop, episode 30, and injuries on fossilized trilobites. Oh, cool. They examined 38 specimens of trilobites that had various healed injuries on the head and thoracic segments. So that means they got injured, but there's evidence that they survived and began to heal those injuries. They got away. These included two species, Redlichia tacuensis and Redlichia rex. In addition to these 38 injured specimens, they also (laughs) examined what they described as two, quote, mangled remains... Oh. Of individuals that are thought to have been damaged by predation or scavenging. Oh, <laughs> mangled remains. Now, trilobites have a hard exoskeleton, so it takes a certain amount of power to eat or damage a trilobite. You have to crunch through it. These are durophagus predators or scavengers, right? Hard stuff eating animals that have to go after these. They did a big survey of the various injuries to see if we could learn anything about how things were eating trilobites. One interesting thing they found is that across both species, most of the injuries are toward the back end of the body. Okay. Which suggests that predators were attacking them from behind, which we see in some predators today. They will preferentially sneak up behind. Or, and or, it could be that the trilobites were turning around either to get in a defensive posture when they saw a predator, or to try to run away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which ended up with most of the bites, the damage, happening towards the back. Because, like, even if they don't have, like, a particular defense in that direction, getting bit in the butt is way better than getting bit in the head. Yes. They also found that lots of trilobite injuries would happen on either the right or left side instead of across the middle. All right. But... Previous research, and I actually remembered this when I was reading this, there was previous research that found a preference for trilobites getting attacked on one side. I think it was the right side. This research did not find the same preference. This found roughly an equal amount on both sides, so that might not be a universal thing with trilobite predators. All right, and because, yeah, I would have so many questions. Right? Why? (laughs) That was the colorful side. (laughs) Yeah, right? That was the side you could see. (laughs) It had a big old red target on it. (laughs) They also found that the injured specimens in both species typically were on the larger size range that those species reached, which also is interesting, probably not because of necessarily predator preference, but because of the benefits of being big smaller trilobites were probably less likely, if they survived, to go on and heal from their injuries versus dying or getting caught by something else. And if they did get bit, a small trilobite is more likely to just get eaten and crunched up. Yeah. So the fossil record is preferentially providing us with big specimens to look at. It makes me think of like, it would be actually very difficult for you to try to only injure an ant. Yes. Like to only... You just give it a scratch? Yes. Yeah. No, you're going to crush it. <laughs> yeah. But if you get a Madagascar hissing cockroach... Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be easy to just do a little bit of damage. That to. thing's tough. <laughs> and then, of course, they came upon the question of who is eating these trilobites? Who is it that's actually damaging them? And they described that there are two main candidates based on the size a predator would need to be to cause these injuries and to produce the coprolites they looked at. So they found a bunch of coprolites that are rich in shelly trilobite bits, but they're pretty big coprolites. Okay. So altogether, they're thinking, this has got to be a big predator, and the two main candidates are either Anomalocarids, which is Anomalocaris and its radiodont friends 
the sort of flat lobstery looking thing with the two appendages coming off the front of its face, or Red Lickia rex itself, Ooh. the larger of the two species of trilobites they looked at, which could grow up to 25 centimeters or 10 inches long. That's almost a foot long trilobite, which at that time was one of the largest things crawling around. Oh yeah, well, I mean that that's getting up to like giant isopod size, like mm-hmm. decent for an arthropod. In this paper, at least, these authors suspect it wasn't anomalocarids doing the damage because their suspicion is that those appendages of anomalocarids wouldn't have been strong enough to do the damage they're seeing on these trilobites. Oh. Now, it doesn't sound like there was any sort of biomechanical analysis or anything. This sounds like it's more just sort of looking at the anatomy and interpreting what it would have been capable of. But they at least are putting forth the hypothesis that more than likely this damage and this trilobite feeding was done by other trilobites. Larger trilobites, Red Lickia rex in particular, was going after trilobites for its prey. And if that's the case, if we were able to find more evidence to conclusively show that, that would make this the oldest known example of cannibalism in the fossil record. Oh, that's awesome. According to a couple of the articles that I saw, there have been previous evidences of a group of animals or a species eating other individuals of its own species. As far back as the late Ordovician, 450 million years ago, this would be more than 60 million years older than that. Finding a species preying upon other individuals of the of its own species cannibalism way back in the cambrian that's awesome which and i saw one of the articles described a couple of other scientists weighing in and basically saying that isn't surprising but it is cool to know yes well it's it's completely expected especially for a a group of arthropods arthropods eat each other all the time and if you're the big thing crawling around trying to eat stuff Especially if you're not a specialist, it's more than likely other of your own species are going to end up being on the menu. Yes. So like that happens with animals all over the place and very, very common with invertebrates for sure. But actually getting evidence of it is still, well, and especially because we're in the Cambrian when we're putting into place a lot of the food chain dynamics for the first time, you know, yes, th- there's a lot of the th- the predation styles that we are so used to showed up in the Cambrian as far as we can tell. And now cannibalism seems that it also showed up. It's not surprising, but it's cool to add another thing to the list of, yeah, when things, when animals started eating each other in the Cambrian, here's all the ways they started doing at this time. Yep. Which is awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Well, my next bit of news is not specifically about who's eating who, but what they were using to eat each other. This is research on what the earliest jaws might have been like and what it tells us about jaw evolution. Do, do, do. <laughs> you got to stop there for copyright reasons. <laughs> One more dupe. And, then, and then, that's it. And we John been... Williams is going to knock down the door. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> And this research is by William Deakin et al. in Science Advances, and the article is a press release from the University of Bristol in phys.org. So, the evolution of jaws goes back to the Silurian-Devonian times. Right, around 400 million years ago or thereabouts. This is when we see the first jawed vertebrates, you know, moving mouth where you can actually bite stuff. We have a lot of info, actually, about how we think the jaw evolved from gill structures, the gill arches, around the mouth. We even have info on how teeth likely evolved, but we don't have a lot of information about what those earliest jaws were probably functioning like. Right. Also, teeth evolution, episode 88. Oh, yes. So this research is looking into how were these earliest biters biting? You know, what kind of bites would they have had? To research this, they took a look at early jaws from those early jawed vertebrates, and then mathematically estimated theoretical jaw shapes in morphospace analysis to see what the potential array of ancestral jaws might have been like. Okay. So basically coming up with a selection of jaws that might fit those earliest jawed vertebrates. Based on what we have in the fossil record and what we know from tracing jaw evolution back from what we have today. Precisely. 
They then took these theoretical jaws and tested them for strength and speed. Now, what they defined strength as was how much force did it take to break the jaw? Right. (laughs) How resilient was it to its own bite force? How hard could it bite before it went wrong? Which is often how we measure bite force. Absolutely. And then speed was measured by how efficient was the jaw closing and opening? You know, was it a smooth so that it could be quick or probably not very smooth so not very quick? Part of the reason these two are looked at is that they are often in trade-off with one another, that the faster you bite, typically the less strength you put behind it, and the more strong your bite is, the less speed you typically are biting with. Comparing these theoretical jaws to the real jaws brought them to the conclusion that the earliest jaws seem to likely have been optimized for strength and speed, basically being as strong a bite as it could be while being as fast as it could. Okay, so not the strongest and not the fastest, but as strong as you could be without needing to be slow and as fast as you could be without needing to be a weak bite. Exactly. So this is interesting because it seems very optimized, a very efficient, effective bite, which indicates a couple of things. One, that early jawed vertebrates evolved to functionally useful bites very quickly. Yeah, that there wasn't some... Long period of kind of functioning jaws or jaws that kind of did their job. They early on evolved very efficient, very useful jaw shapes. Exactly. This also potentially indicates that those early biters were predators. This this is the bite of a predator that typically, at least, that a strong, fast bite is usually used to catch other things that you're going to kill and eat. That's true. You don't really need a super bite if you're going after carrion or algae or something. Yeah, that's not usually struggling as much. It also says that the diversity of jaw shapes we see diverged away from this optimum into the fast bites and the super strong bites, but also the slower bites and the weaker bites, that those are divergences from what was likely a very functional, optimized biting jaw. And since then, we've seen different specializations in jaws for different functions. Precisely. And so it's not that we went from a very poor bite and eventually got good bites. We likely started with good biting ability and then diverged into all the weird bites that we're now doing. Yeah, which is a cool thing to know because that might seem unexpected because we so often can get caught thinking about evolution as starting out not good and getting good. Yes. That it's easy for us to think, well, yeah, this feature must have started as some bad version of itself and then progressively went uh, underwent selection to something better, something more fit. But oftentimes features at early in their evolution are already under enough selective pressure to be good, to be efficient, to be high quality in terms of survivability. And then they diversify and adjust in descendants as different environments and different habitats exhibit different stresses on them. Yeah, and I think a lot of that mentality that the older version must be poorer somehow comes from our human world, because that's how things work in our in the world that we're interacting with, that the older version of whatever you're surrounded by, the older version of cars, are definitely not as good as cars are today. Right. Old computers are definitely not as good as computers today. Old tools, old clothes, whatever it is typically is always the worst version the farther back in time you go. Right. When we talk about the evolution of technology, we're often talking about progress and improvement, but the evolution of life is more often just about change and adaptation, not necessarily getting better in that same linear sense. Yes, precisely. Very cool. Well, I don't even have a segue into my next bit of news, because my next bit of news is about de-extinction. Ah. Specifically exploring some of the limitations of de-extinction. Ooh, that's very that's very good to talk about. This is research in the journal Current Biology by Jianqing Lin et al. And we will link in the blog post to an article in Science News by Anna Gibbs. De-extinction is the extremely sensational idea of bringing extinct species back to life. We've talked about this before. We did a whole episode about it back in episode 35. Generally speaking, when people talk about de-extinction, and we talked about this in that episode, There are three main methods they're often discussing. 
One is backbreeding, which is using modern animals to breed them into an ancestral state, like people have talked about doing with aurochs from cattle. The other, probably the most immediate one that comes to mind for most people, is cloning. Yep. This is what they did with Celia the Bucardo, and it's what they claim to be doing in Jurassic Park, yes. for example. But both of those strategies more or less require you to have complete living cells, or ex very recently living cells. So for ancient stuff, and there's all this discussion about doing de-extinction uh, attempts for things like woolly mammoths and thylacines and passenger pigeons, what they are talking about doing is genetic engineering. Specifically, taking ancient genomes, so getting the DNA we can out of the ancient species, finding a close relative and using the close relative's genome to map the ancient one. Because ancient DNA is always fragmentary and broken apart, and we don't actually have the full sequence. But if we have a close living relative, like an Asian elephant for a mammoth, we can look at the complete Asian elephant genome, take all of our mammoth DNA, and use the elephant genome to help as like a scaffold, as a reference to put together our woolly mammoth genome. Then the plan by some is to then edit the elephant genome basically to f account for the differences mm -hmm. to edit an elephant genome into a woolly mammoth genome or edit what we have uh, that we know of the woolly mammoth genome and fill it in with what we're missing with the elephant basically creating somewhat of a hybrid is it kind of like the scene in jurassic park when mr dna is filling in the holes to complete the code right with the frogs this has been talked about being done with mammoths and passenger pigeons this research basically sets out to ask the question, how big a deal is it that the ancient DNA is incomplete? Yeah. And to do so, they chose not mammoths nor pigeons, but the Christmas Island rat. Hmm. This is a species, Rattus mcleari, formerly endemic to Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean, which went extinct in the early 1900s, possibly due to the introduction of black rats to the island. Here in this study, they got... Genetic information from preserved skin samples, I think they said two different specimens, sequenced as much of the genome of the Christmas Island rats as they could, and this is only, you know, these are 100 years old or so, and then mapped it using the reference of Norway black rats, which are still around today, and are close cousins, and have a very well-known genetic code. They've been very well studied. Cool. And what they found is... When they used the very well-known genome of Norway black rats to map the pretty well-sequenced genome of Christmas Island rats, they found that about 5% of the genome is still incomplete. All right. That they were only able to recover, to restore, about 95% of the Christmas Island rat genome. They found that over 1,600 genes were incomplete incomplete, only partially recovered from their sequencing, and 26 genes were totally absent. Ooh. And what was really interesting that they noted is that what was missing isn't random. Really? Most of the incompleteness they found is in genetic regions linked to immune responses and olfaction, so the sense of smell, episode 130. And what this led them to suggest is that the reason... Those genes are left incomplete when we're using this modern species as a reference to rebuild this ancient species genome is not because the method is flawed, but because those are areas where their genetic code diverged. Oh. That they were so different in those genetic regions that we can't use the modern species as a reference to reliably put together those sections of this extinct rat's DNA. That makes so much sense. Like, basically, if you have this ancient creature and you get its DNA, if you happen to be missing one of the things that made it stand out from, that made it unique from whatever species you'd be using to try to fill in the gaps, mm -hmm. you have nothing to fill that gap. You'd have to guess. You'd have to randomly fill in some genes because you don't yes. know. Estimates. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Research has estimated that Norway black rats and Christmas Island rats diverged about two and a half million years ago. So these would be the regions that became distinct in that time. 
There are rats that are more closely related. So the black rat, I believe they used, but they said that that was just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. It was still about 5% that they were missing. And this is really important to note because the stuff that made an ancient species different from its closest living relatives is probably the stuff, like you said, that made it distinct. Yes. That made it able to live the way it did or in the habitat that it did. Which means that if we were to use these modern rat species to genetically edit and put together a hypothetical Christmas Island rat species, we would probably be missing some of the important things, the key things that made those rats distinct. Absolutely. We would have a Christmas Island rat flavored rat. Yes. It would have a lot of the characteristics and it would might even look the same but it might be missing some of the key things. It's like like banana-flavored things. It's definitely not <laughs> banana. And some of those things might be the reasons we would want to de-extinct a species in the first place. Now, all this is not news. Not really in the broad scope. No one doing de-extinction work thinks they're going to get 100% the ancient species that they're trying to get. We're not going to get 100% woolly mammoth. We're not going to get 100% passenger pigeon. And the authors uh, actually make this really interesting point I hadn't thought of. They said, we're also unlikely to try to do this with the Christmas Island rat. Mm -hmm. But that's not a species, apparently, that's on the top of anyone's list for de-extinction. But this kind of analysis, they point out, is a good way to measure basically how close are you going to be able to get what will you actually end up missing and once you have a sense of what you're missing is that stuff important enough that it means it's not worth trying to do this so in the case of mammoths we've talked about how woolly mammoths the idea of de-extinction oftentimes is explained as a way to try to restore ecosystems that used to have large elephant relatives and don't anymore And they point out that woolly mammoths and Asian elephants diverged about as long ago as these two rat species did. Is the amount we'd be missing a big enough deal that it kind of gets in the way? Yes. This kind of analysis might be a good way to measure, is this actually worth doing? What will we be missing? Uh, And they point out that passenger pigeons and their closest relatives, band-tailed pigeons, diverged, I think it was like twice as far back. Oh, wow. So that's even more... Likely that we're going to be missing some really important stuff. And it's like there is the potentially lucky scenario that you get really good ancient DNA that happens to be missing parts that are the same as your modern group. I would imagine so. But the the likeliness of that scenario, considering how much coding there is in DNA, you're not going to only be missing the inconvenient. You're not going to only be missing the convenient parts. Yeah. That you're going to be missing chunks all over the place. And inevitably, some of those are going to line up with things that are fundamentally different between the two species. Now, they did point out in the paper that there is, they mentioned at least one method that has been proposed as a potential partial solution to this, which is similar to the news you just mentioned, comparing what we know of the DNA between these species to predict and fill in something that might be closer to the extinct species because it is more what the ancestor was like rather than what the living species, which has diverged further from the extinct species. Yeah, it's taking a step back to get a little bit of a step closer. Yes. Although this paper points out that that could very well be helpful, but it's only ever going to be a partial... It's going to get you closer, but it's unlikely to be a perfect solution no and it's also an estimated like that is a calculated set of genes that you'd be filling in Mm -hmm. potentially with very good data backing it up like you might be able to have a really good calculation setup because you have enough input but you're still estimating what the ancestor may have been like and hoping that that is indeed a step closer to the feature that this extinct species then evolved to. So yeah, you'd still be potentially missing a lot of crucial info. This, of course, is a fascinating topic, and if you'd like to hear more about ancient DNA and de-extinction, check out episodes 34 and 35, where we talked at length about that stuff. That's just so awesome. I, lo- I that's, that's These are cool questions to be able to get answers to. Right? That's exactly what I'm thinking right now. Well, speaking of topics that tend to make a huge amount of noise... 
when they come up in Paleo News. My next bit deals with Spinosaurus. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't talked about Spinosaurus since, you know, a few weeks ago or so, I'm sure, when it was last in the news. Also, episode 42 for more about Spinosaurus. Yes, and specifically, this is about Spinosaurus, not the, just... The group that includes Spinosaurus. But also other long-snouted dinosaur rel- cousins. This was research looking at their bones to try to determine how aquatic were they. This research is by Matteo Fabri et al. in Nature, and the article is by Riley Black in Smithsonian Mag. So spinosaurs have been noted to be associated with the water for a while. Right. If this is the first time you've heard us talk about spinosaurs, these are the theropod dinosaurs, carnivorous, famous for spinosaurus with its long croc-like snout and its big sail, but also including other famous dinosaurs like Baryonyx and Suchomimus. Precisely. And they've been associated, that crocolite snout seems very good for fishing, and some of them have been found with fish material around them and in their stomach area. So spinosaurus have been associated with the water, and some, as I'm sure many have heard, have been accused of being semi-aquatic. Research over the last several years has continuously found varying degrees of evidence for spinosaurus specifically being associated with the water, aquatic, foraging in the water to some degree. This includes things like it has kind of broad splayed feet that may have been good for paddling. The tail very recently has been found to maybe be croc-like, you know, paddle-shaped down the length for swimming. But one thing that's often been noted is that it has denser bones, what seem to be unusually dense bones for a terrestrial land-living animal which is a very common feature of secondarily aquatic animals. Like hippos and crocs and penguins. Early whales were also noted with this. Mm -hmm. This feature has evolved in multiple groups that have gone back to the water. So this research was looking at, can we use that as a determining factor if there are dinosaurs that show this aquatic feature without showing other aquatic features? One of the things the article made a point of is that the question for this research partially started from a hippopotamus skeleton, which has those dense bones and is a very aquatic, you know, spends tons of its time in the water. But if you just glance at the skeleton, you might not immediately think that thing swims or that thing moves in the water. It doesn't have paddle-like feet. It doesn't have a hydrodynamic body. So maybe there are dinosaurs that had some, had adaptations for being in the water that we wouldn't see based on the shape of the dinosaur. And the reason denser bones help you is that it makes you neutrally buoyant, so it makes you easier to go under the water. If you just wanted to float, you wouldn't need this. So if you're just needing to swim across the water, which we know dinosaurs have done, there's evidence of theropods paddling across water and leaving paddle marks in the sediment. But if you're wanting to actually be in the water... For swimming or foraging or whatever. Having heavier bones keeps you from floating and makes it easier so that you're not having to fight your buoyancy to go under. They studied samples of bones from 380 different species, both living and extinct, including 36 thigh bones and 12 rib bones from non-avian dinosaurs. This included spinosaurs, but also just other dinosaurs, long necks and so forth. And they found some interesting patterns among the spinosaurs particularly, which is what's been making the news rounds. Once again, spinosaurus, yes fell out on the denser side. So that confirmed, you know, corroborated earlier research. They said it was actually similar to that of hippos. Like, it is very similar density. Which at this point is not unexpected. No, that makes sense. Two other spinosaurs, though, came out with different results. Baryonyx, which is famous for one of the specimens being found with fish scales in its stomach and around its fossils, was found with similar... Density, not quite, not quite as dense as Spinosaurus, but a density that would have been suitable for swimming. Okay. So Baryonyx seems like it would have been at least buoyancy-wise good at moving in the water. Suchomimus, which is very similar to Baryonyx, very comparable, even in their size, shows none of that bone density. It has normal, you know, quote-unquote normal density bones for land dinosaurs, land predators like T-Rex and other big theropods on land, doesn't seem like it was adapted for swimming in and under the water. 
which is notable because on the surface, the two look incredibly similar. Yeah, that's a really interesting study because we talk so much about Spinosaurus being the one that we think may have been foraging in or under the water. And other Spinosaurus we know may have eaten fish, but it is fascinating to learn that Baryonyx may have also been doing that. That Spinosaurus was not necessarily unique in those habits, but also fascinating to find that not all Spinosaurus were doing that. Yes, exactly. That Suchomimus may have been a terrestrial, less of a water-dwelling, water-foraging uh, dinosaur, even though it is in the same group and has a very similar body shape. Which brings up some evolutionary questions. Was Is this a sign that the group was aquatic ancestrally, that Spinosaurus really originated as a fairly swimming adapted group and then some diverged away back onto land or did swimming ad- adaptations evolve multiple times mm-hmm. separately or just in some groups so and those we do not know those are things we right. will have to do more research on more spinosaurs to figure out it's also interesting because they said that this still does not reconcile the differences between some of the physical anatomies of the dinosaurs and this seeming swimming ability their neck structure still seems to support more of a downward striking like a heron Mm -hmm. feeding style not a hunting in the water like a croc right feeding style their head is not in line with the body like a croc's is it still has that downward facing so even if even though this is more support for them swimming we still don't fully know what they were doing with that just because they were swimming doesn't mean they were hunting in the water right it hippos mean... don't hunt in the water precisely mm-hmm. they said this does not mean they are true croc mimics they still may be living a very different lifestyle right and you can also imagine you know a hippo doesn't spend its time swimming underwater chasing after things like a croc does they spend lots of time in the water but they're still mostly sticking to the surface yeah so having dense bones like this doesn't necessarily mean you were hunting like a croc or hunting like a shark It could have been doing kind of a heron thing. It could have been spending time near the water and going into the water for various reasons. Actually, I wonder, maybe uh, being in the water would have helped with mating. Oh, yeah. Right? Being a little bit buoyant. Although I guess that'd be kind of the opposite of what the dense bones would do. Yeah, right. (laughs) So, yeah, it's there's lots of things that they could be. It might just be to get around, you know, that you still hunt at the shoreline, but you want to swim across and down and be able to you know, maybe get out of the sun and cool off. And Mm -hmm. there, it could be much more of a lifestyle than a hunting feature. So we have all this great evidence telling us that Spinosaurus and some of its relatives were probably semi-aquatic to some degree. They were good in the water, but exactly what they were doing in the water, let's keep doing Spinosaurus research, I guess. Yep, and not all (laughs) of their cousins were doing it. But this also does make them really the first group of fairly confirmed somewhat aquatic dinosaurs yeah which is it's awesome that's pretty cool (laughs) and speaking of weird things that like to swim i think we can wrap up the news and move on to our main topic of even weirder looking swimming predators yeah no you're not wrong (laughs) (laughs) truly bizarre predators of the water the seahorses let's find out what they are exactly after this short break Seahorses, contrary to their names, are not actually horses of the sea. Mm. I wanted to start this episode and just rip the band-aid off. They don't have an odd number of toes? No, no. Or high crown teeth? They don't even have a number of toes. No. That's it. That's an even number. So definitely not Perissodactyls. We call those land seahorses. So seahorses. This is one of those groups that I, I, I we've all seen because they're just they're everywhere. They're we we put them we put them in bathrooms on the walls all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> like they're just they're a very charismatic but super odd group. Yeah, they're the among the weirdest fish, and that's really they are fish, and not just that, but bony fish. They are a teliest fish, so they are. Like your trouts and goldfish and sturgeon and all those. These nestle right in with those. That's just a fish that's doing something really weird. That is just so bizarre. 
So let's start with the name, seahorses. The genus name is Hippocampus, which hippo means horse. Yes, like hippopotamus, the river horse. Exactly. Campus means sea monster. Ooh. One up on the hippopotamus. That's pretty cool. <laughs> this is the horse sea monster, which is fitting. Hippocampus mythologically was a half horse, half fish Greek monster. Yeah, no relation really to the part of your brain. No. Called the hippocampus, episode 121. Which is called that because it's shaped like a seahorse. Yes. Because <laughs> you got a seahorse in your brain. There you go. Inside of each of us is a seahorse. <laughs> <laughs> now, one interesting thing is all seahorses are in that one genus. Okay. They are all hippocampus. So this is a relatively small, closely related group. Uh, mm -hmm. There are at least... 30 species, but potentially up to 50. Okay. So not huge, but not like 12. Right. Like, but also not hundreds. No. Yeah. All right. That's a pretty limited scope of species. Which is, I was surprised by looking this up because I, I just, seahorses are so ubiquitous in ocean discussions so often that oh, yeah. I thought that they must have been just everywhere and all over and super specious. I also, I think I just kind of have an unconscious assumption that any group of fish just has thousands <laughs> of species. Yeah, no, that's true. But they are actually fairly well distributed. They're found throughout tropical temperate regions in both the Atlantic and Indo-Pacific. So yet you can find seahorses basically anywhere. It's pretty warmish. They are quite diverse as far as the shapes and types of seahorse. They range in size from 1.5 centimeters to 35 centimeters. Ooh. So a little less than an inch to 14 inches. Yeah. The smallest one is the pygmy seahorse. Makes sense. There you go. And the biggest one is the big belly seahorse or <laughs> pot belly seahorse. <laughs> now, many of us have an image of what a seahorse is because if you've seen a cartoon that takes place in the ocean, at some point they'll usually show a seahorse. They're very charismatic in that regard. And fun to draw. And very fun to draw. <laughs> so and very cartoonists like them. Cute. But let's go over some of their very unique anatomy. Seahorses have a number of traits that really do stand them out from your average fish. The horse-like head, which they get their name from, is one right there. Like, that's weird. Part of that head is a long, fused, tubular snout with the mouth at the very tip, and it is not one that they can open normally. Right, they don't, it's not, it doesn't hinge open and close. Like you think of a crocodile, mm -hmm. typical jaw structure with a long snout. Theirs is just a tube. Yes, and it flexes open more than it hinges open. It's oh, very odd. Independently moving eyeballs. All right, like a chameleon. Like a chameleon. <laughs> a flexible prehensile tail. Mm -hmm. And they can use to hold on to stalks and stuff under sea. Exactly. Typically very camouflaged skin. That's very common among throughout this group that they are very often camouflaged in a lot of different ways. Oh, yeah. Camouflaged to different habitats and structures, but almost always camouflaged to some degree. Which makes sense for a group of animals that don't move very fast. Yes. Another interesting aspect of their skin is bony dermal armor. Yeah, they're all bumpy and rigid on the outside, Rid like ridged, rid like ruffles. Yes, <laughs> and we will talk at length about that because that's a very characteristic thing of this group. I can't wait till the ruffles discussion. <laughs> a notable absence of tail and pelvic fins, so the fins at the underside back of the body, they are have reduced their fins greatly. Yeah, it, it's so weird to think of a seahorse as a fish because mm -hmm. they're so different. But once you do, you start noticing all the stuff they're missing. Yes. So yeah, tail fins, pelvic fins, anal fins, dorsal fins. These are all fins that most fish have. Mm -hmm. And a seahorse seems to have gotten rid of a lot of them. They have. They do still have the dorsal fin, which is raised and their main mode of propulsion. Mm -hmm. That's what they... On the back. And undulate around to move very slowly just putter around <laughs> they do have pectoral fins so fins you know the arm fins so to speak mm -hmm. that they use to maneuver with so they do have those upper fins they are not graceful swimmers they are at the whims of the currents you'll see them bob a whole lot because they're not able to fight it yeah strangely enough nowhere near as fluid dynamic as 
land horses. <laughs> and then probably one of the last but most unique things is male pregnancy. Oh, yes, of course. That The, the reason they're in all the documentaries. Yes, that they are all male brooding species. The males hold on to the babies until they hatch. Yeah, and give birth. Like, these have pouches that they contain the babies in. A little fish marsupium. And yeah, and it's very much like a marsupium. It is actually giving birth. It's not just holding on to eggs. It's actually caring for them. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of discussion about that throughout this episode, because <laughs> that's a big thing. And there's a lot of research into it, because it is has the potential for lots of insights into sexual evolution. Yeah. In a group. True, true. Now, with all these weird features... I feel like it can often be easy or, or easy to confuse or difficult to figure out. How, what, is, what does a seahorse do? Yeah. Like, what, what is this? How are you a seahorse? Like, how do you be a seahorse? What do you do in the ocean? Right. When you're not just looking pretty and yeah. floating in front of the camera. Exactly. Because it's not often that you see them doing much. They're not swimming around. They're not being very active from what we can tell, you know, at a glance. Mostly they're staying stationary or relatively stationary by hooking their tail onto a plant, a coral, something, and hiding among the structure. Their camouflage is their main defense. So they just sit there, blending into the branches or foliage, but they are carnivores. Mm -hmm. These are hunters of very, very teeny tiny little shrimps and prey. Like things, just things that fit in that tube mouth. Itty bitty for the itty bitty mouth. And so they're hiding there from predators. But just as things float by them, they will suck it up using suction feeding. Mm -hmm. And it almost looks like a hiccup when they do it. It's this very rapid jerky motion. Their head clips forward and the mouth opens and sucks up the prey. And the head comes back to that resting you know, a, a poised horse position that they're always <laughs> that in. That regal pose. Yes, exactly. This is actually known as pivot feeding. They pivot the head forward, suck up the prey, and bring it back. Interesting. And it is fast. Like, it looks just like this little hiccup of a movement. Uh, which is pretty common among fish. Yes. Uh, a lot of fish have a very quick suction feeding, enforced, enhanced uh, bite. Yes. That they'll grab a prey, and it's a really fast motion. And because it's fast and because their prey is small, you often won't notice what they're doing when you see it. Ha like, you'll just see them and their little heads will go, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. and he's like, oh, what are they doing? Well, they're eating. They're catching, not quite microscopic, but hard for you to see at a distance prey. Yeah. So even though they don't typically, even though they don't look exciting in their behavior, they are carnivores. They're predators. But they're also prey for a lot of stuff. They're not very big. So they are food for lots of things. So they they do have defenses. Main defense is camouflage, and they can get really crazy with the camouflage. Their skin will often be covered in what's sometimes called excrescences, which are structures coming off the skin to aid in their camouflage. Filaments, bobs, bulbs, knobs, spiny bits. Yeah, the kind of stuff you want to have if you're trying to blend in with seaweed or corals or sponges or whatever <laughs> to look else. look less like an animal that would be swimming around. Yes. <laughs> you don't have the outline. Even though you're already a seahorse. Oh, yes. <laughs> Even more, you don't have the outline <laughs> I that you expect from a fish. I already don't look like a fish. Now I don't want to look like a seahorse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are insanely good. Mm -hmm. uh, pygmy seahorse particularly often have little knobby bits that look like coral polyps. And if they're hiding on a coral, it can be difficult to spot them. For us with our great spotting things. <laughs> Even if you know what you're looking for. Absolutely. I would miscount the pygmy seahorses at the aquarium all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so these are some extreme levels of camouflage among this group. But they are also armored that bony dermal skeleton is a defensive structure. Now, this is subdermal, so it is just underneath the skin. They're not actually bony on the outside. Right. So but, it's kind of like a, a crocodile with the bony armor just below the skin. Exactly. But they are covered in that literally their entire body is just section by section, ring by ring of these bony ringlets. Cool. And... This not only provides protection, but also provides structure to the body. It is a lot of what their muscles are attaching to to move. 
and gives a lot of the tail its prehensibility and maneuverability, but it still acts defensively and resists crushing is really the main thing that it's doing because a lot of their predators have crushing attacks like crabs and sea turtles. So if they can avoid that, they might get away. Another odd thing about this these dermal rings, especially on the tail section, they're square in cross section. Like if you sliced into a seahorse tail and looked at the end, you would have a, a not perfect square, but a four cornered shape. Huh. They aren't round. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. And there's been research into why. Why is your armor the way it is? Why are you shaped like this? And they found a few things. One, it does actually help with the jointedness of the tail. The way the rings interlock, the square shapes interlock, actually allows for some decent maneuverability and might actually aid in the prehensileness of their tail. But also, they are deformable. The armor can deform, meaning it can be squished and collapse, but then will reform back to shape. Ah. It's like a memory structure. And so it makes it that they can still take pressure and be deformed, but they don't shatter. Exactly. They'll return to form. Oh, that's really cool. That's a fun engineering note. And that's that's what the research that looked into this did. I believe it. (laughs) Is they made 3D and 3D printed models to then test the shapes and see what mechanical advantages there might be. And the paper was saying that we could actually learn building tips from the structure of these ringlets on a seahorse tail. Cool. So in the future, seahorse-shaped skyscrapers. Oh, yes. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Yep, that's what I want. (laughs) That's what I want to live in. But as cool and weird as this group is, and as well-studied as some aspects of them are, there are some things that are a little bit more blurry. The definite relationships among seahorses is not always completely agreed upon. Part of it is there's a lot of convergent evolution going on. Mm. Uh, since they use camouflage and the shape of their body you know, to hide as such a big part of their defense, there's a lot of selective pressure on it. And so a lot of them can look very different, but be closely related or look similar, but not be closely related. And so the exact breakdown of all of the species in this genus, there's some debate on. Uh, I also found one paper that noted... Previously, there were more than 100 species identified. Revised studies brought it down to 30 or so valid species. Gotcha. So there's still a lot of research to be done in the actual taxonomy of this group. And that also continues into the past, which we will get into. Mm -hmm. They are an awesome group, but there's still lots to learn about how they're related to one another. Well, good. They'll keep being in documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, I feel it's a good segue to start talking about the overall relationships and taxonomy of this group, which means we need to zoom out a bit because seahorses have a number of related groups that are also super weird. Yeah, (laughs) that aren't seahorses, but are pretty seahorse-like. Absolutely. This overall group is called the Signathids, and that name refers to their fused jaw, together jaw. I had that realization as we were sitting down to record, and you mentioned the family name. Mm-hmm. When Signa- oh, yeah, that, that means the jaw is fused, doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> All of them have that fused jaw, and a number of other seahorse features are shared across this group. Mm-hmm. These are found among an order called the Signathiformes, which include a bunch of kind of similarly shaped things or similarly looking-ish. A lot of them have long or fused-ish jaws but are not signathids, not signathidae, which we will get into. This overall group includes things like the trumpet fish, cornet fish, snipe fishes, shrimp fishes, all of which have a not quite seahorse look to them, but you can see the family resemblance. Right. And I'm going to show David the pictures here so he can get a look at their weird jaws. Oh yeah, I think I've seen trumpet fish before. They were the one that I definitely knew, and we had shrimp fish. Okay, yeah, I can see those feet, I, that that sort of seahorse-like external appearance. The face especially looks a bit seahorsey. Exactly, but their body is still very fishy. Yes, those are fish. They are fish. Not horses. No, definitely not horses. Not even trying, really. <laughs> oh man, I have a joke about seahorses. I don't know what the setup is, but the punchline is sea biscuit. 
<laughs> You're a very slow race. <laughs> As we go into this group, we get to the suborder Signathoidae, which includes our super family, Signathoidae, which is where we're getting out real close to this group. In this, there are two families, two major families at least, the Solenostomidae, which are the ghost pipefish, which are sister group to Signathidae, which are your seahorses and pipefish. These are what typically, when people say Signathids, they mean Signathidae. These are your seahorses and seahorse-adjacent weirdos. Here we have the Signathinae, the subfamily, which includes pipefishes and sea dragons, and basically most of the Signathids. This is actually the vast majority of the group. Then we have Hippocampinae, which is your seahorses and pygmy seahorses. So it really most of this group is not seahorses. So seahorses are the weirdos, even in their own group. Of weirdos. <laughs> exactly. So let's take a, a walk through the family tree. The ghost pipefish are real close. They're real similar. They've got a lot. Of, they've still got a very long, unfish-like body form in a lot of ways. A lot of times they're swimming straight up and down to blend into stuff and hide among foliage or structures. But they do have pelvic fins, and that really sets them apart from the rest of the Cygnathids. So they are sister group. We will mention them and come back because they are important for evolutionary purposes. Signathidae, while seahorses did not have a huge amount of species, Signathidae actually has a good amount. There are 300 species from brackish to freshwater to, open to ocean water. So they are widespread, diverse, and a decent number. You know, once again, we're not talking thousands, but 300 species with over 50 recognized genera among those species. The shared features of this group, many of which we've already mentioned in the seahorse, but the elongated fused snout, all of them have it. Absence of pelvic fins, all of them don't have it. Many of them, most of them, typically do not have a caudal or tail fin as well, but there are a few that still have itty-bitty little tail fins. Okay. And then that bony, subdermal, ringed armor is a feature of this whole group. They're all knobby and bumpy with that weird shaped armor. And then, surprisingly, the whole group shows male pregnancy. Oh, so it's not just a seahorse thing. Exactly. Seahorses and their close relatives also do it. Yes. Now, not all of them do it to the extent seahorses do it. They have okay. varying amounts and degrees of how pregnant the male gets. <laughs> Some of it's more brooding. Mm -hmm. So usually you'll see it say, called male brooding. But the whole group, the male is the one that carries the eggs after fertilization. Among these, we have the pipe fishes, which basically look like a straightened out seahorse. Yeah, they look like a pipe. Yep. As the name. It's like an eel, but if the eel was round and bony. Yes. Well, it's it's the thing that I always think of with pipe fish is it looks like it took a lot of the weird things of a seahorse. You know, the knobbly body, the lack of fins, the long straw face. But then it's like, oh yeah, yeah, but that's what... A thing that has those would look like, I assume. Still fish-shaped, still swimming sideways a lot of the time. You're still a fish. And mm -hmm. then a seahorse got all... Took that and bent it in all these different directions. Right. They crashed into coral and got <laughs> bent around the coral and stuck that way. Made the accordion sound. <laughs> <laughs> these, though, still are very similar to seahorses. Their dorsal fin is often their main way of moving around, even though they're swimming sideways like a fish they're not swimming side to side like a fish they're still mostly puttering right so they're not moving their tail back and forth yeah. the way you think of with fishes and sharks they are just it's well like much like a seahorse the body is mostly rigid mm -hmm. this time i mean rigid like not moving like <laughs> a like a pipe like an object that doesn't bend at all and then there is this little fluttering fin that just kind of moves the whole thing like a spaceship. Yep. Just brrr, through the water. They will, though, sometimes have a little tail fin. So this is the group that sometimes does have that fin. But when it is absent, and it is absent in many groups, their tail is often also prehensile. Huh. Yeah. So there are some, like the alligator pipe fish is the one that... I'm most familiar with because it was of with the course. aquarium. Yep. Of course. It's, it would be. It's such, it's such a lovely like lime green. They're so great. <laughs> I love them. Even in a superficially snake-shaped animal, you managed to make <laughs> an alligator related. 
those were basically just straightened out seahorses. They had a prehensile tail. They were mostly hanging around grass and grabbing onto it and then acting like a blade of grass as they'd wave in it. Cool. They were pretty much just the same thing, but (laughs) not all horse-shaped. So it they're very similar, just visually very distinct. <laughs> also in the group with pipefish are your sea dragons. Yeah. Which kind of have a little bit, they are horizontal like a pipefish, but they're a little more bent in their body shape, like a seahorse. So it's kind of like a horizontal seahorse. Kind of. And there's a group that's actually described as that, that we'll get to in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> but sea dragons, there are two genera. And two species, typically. The leafy sea dragon, Phycodurus equis, and the common, or sometimes I've seen it called weedy sea dragon. Yep. Which is just like, a common was fine. Right, you didn't have to be <laughs> insulting about it. Phylopteryx taniolatus. The leafy sea dragon is, as its name suggests, looks leafy. It looks like foliage. It has this kelp-like structure to it. It has these long, beautiful, decorative... Not fins, just skin growths that look like leaves. Yeah, similar to what you were describing with seahorses having polyps and branch-shaped things coming off of them. This is just, this is like if a top fashion designer was asked to create an over-the-top seahorse. Exactly. Like, this is what a, like, this is if a seahorse needed a dress for the Oscars. Yes, yes. The leafy sea dragon is what it would look like. Absolutely, and they hide among kelp, and they just float just very slowly, mm. still catching prey in the water, but just among the plants. And they're still, even though they look like they're covered in fins, and the fins are swooping backward like big wings, and it looks like they should just be able to motor with all those. Those are not swimming structures. They're still <laughs> only using the little dorsal fin <laughs> the brrr, with just these massive branches growing off their body. They're so beautiful, but also incredibly awkward looking. Yes. Once you actually realize that they can't use any of those to swim, it's just, it's like if you had giant shoulder pads just sticking off your, and trying to maneuver around very slowly and carefully. They feel, leafy sea dragons are like one of the closest things vertebrates get to, to the really impressive leaf mimic insects. Absolutely. It's like, this thing looks like it fell off of a tree. Like a piece of a tree fell off. And it and then it moved around. Yes, yes, yep. <laughs> the weedy still has some of those projections, but not quite as ornate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it looks like one that forgot its dress for the octor- yes. Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> but still very pretty, just not quite as ornamental. Yeah, this one was going to the Oscars in a movie. Yes. And calamity happened on the way there. So by the time it got there, a lot of the dress had fallen apart. (laughs) Both of these are known off the shores of Australia. The weedy is much more, as its other name suggests, common. Mm -hmm. So the common sea dragon is found across more of the coast. The leafy is only known off of Western and South Australia. Very small range, very low numbers. But... Just a few years ago, in 2015, there was a third species discovered. I remember this. Yeah. This new species looks more like the common, but is red in color Mm -hmm. and has a number of distinct morphological and genetic features that stand it out enough to be a new species. This species is Phylopteryx dewisa. And is it the ruby sea dragon? Oh, yes. I, I forgot to look up the common name for it. Yeah, this yeah, is... It's the Ruby Sea, the right? The Ruby that's, that's Sea Dragon. what I thought I remembered. And the Ruby of the Sea. It is uh, also notable for it was found in slightly deeper water. Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember... I think I actually wrote about this. Ah, nice. I think I wrote an article. Uh, I, this probably was on Earth Touch News. I think that's why I know about it, because yep. I wrote about it. And so it is living in a slightly different place. It's a slightly different coloration. So there are three. This one's just very new. As far as our, as far as research goes, new to us. Yes, <laughs> there is also a group called the pipe horses or pygmy huh. pipe horses. Uh, I kept finding it called both of those, and I found different sources grouping them in the Cygnathinae with pipefish and sea dragons. But then a couple others that say no, it is in Hippocampinae with seahorses. With seahorses, these actually look like you took like a seahorse looks like you took a pipefish and bent it. Mm-hmm. This looks like you took a seahorse and straightened it out. 
weird. So it's got the bumps and lumps in the belly. I was just going to say, does it have the belly? <laughs> yeah. Because a, the... a pipefish is just a straight line, mm-hmm. basically. Whereas a sea dragon is a little bit more segmented. It almost looks zigzag. <laughs> yeah. So a pipe horse, you call, I already forgot yeah, what it's called. Pipe, pipe horse. horse is is like the straight line of a pipe fish, but with the belly with and the, the horse head. With the belly and the back of the head, yeah. Weird. Yep. There you go. Oh my goodness. Yeah, no, that's just a straightened seahorse. That's exactly what they are. That's like a seahorse that's got, like the opposite of a spinal disorder. Oh where the, yeah. It's straightened out the spine. Well, it's like when you drop the water on the, the bent up uh, straw wrapper. And it could ding, 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 and unwinds. Yeah. It's yeah. like that. You did that. You dropped a little bit of water on a seahorse, and it. Brrrr. Now this either has three different genus of pygmy pipe horses, or according to some authors, one. Okay, so sure. There's some well, taxonomy unclear. Yes, from what I could tell, uh, I think the most recent is grouping them with seahorses. Okay. Uh, that's the one. That's what I saw most often in the more recent stuff. But then I would also find every, one every now and then that would be like, yeah, pipe fish, sea dragons, pipe horses, moving on. I'd be, oh, okay. Uh, mm. But though there are also those. Okay, sure. <laughs> well, that's a really cool diversity to see amongst this group closely related to seahorses because it already starts getting at the answer to the question that I'm sure we're going to get into later, which is how did you go from being a fish to being a seahorse oh, yeah. shape? And it becomes so much easier when you have these varying, because the whole, the the whole reason that question comes up is you go, I don't understand what the in-between between between just being a fish and just being a seahorse, how does that work? How does Mm -hmm. it work to be kind of like a seahorse? And the answer is it works for actually hundreds of species that are all varying degrees of more or less like a seahorse. And even in their other signathiformes groups, like the shrimp fish looks like a fish, but they've got that long snout. And we had those as well. They hover like a seahorse. Okay. Fluttering their fins. They don't swim with the tail and they hover almost always vertically with their face pointing down and their tail pointing up to blend in with seagrass. And they'll, they'll go as a group and they'll move with the waves to sway like grass so they actually are already mobile wise very much like the signathids. Yeah. So it sounds like seahorses and sea dragons are the extreme end of what is actually a pretty diverse group of fairly seahorse like fish. Yes. One of the things that really does make their group stand out is the male brooding. Yeah, tell me more about that. Let's get into it. Because I've always wondered, I remember thinking about this in the past when I've seen people call it male pregnancy, and I've always been like, is that an accurate, like, are we being a little bit too exaggerated to call it a pregnancy, or is it actually kind of a pregnancy? Oh, what a good question. I'm so excited to learn. What a good question. So, (laughs) among the 300 plus species of cygnathids, they all show male brooding. Now, As mentioned, not all of them go to the extreme of the seahorse where they have this pregnancy pouch. Some, it is more just stuck to the belly. So you get a variety and degrees of extreme on how pregnant they are really getting. You know, some you definitely would not call pregnant because we're just gluing eggs to your belly. Like a frog. You're just just sticking them on there. That's That's not pregnant. But the diversity is notable and does get very extreme. So in all the groups, one way or the other, the female transfers the eggs to the male and very often either in the process of transferring or shortly before or shortly after they are fertilized. Okay. So the male gets the eggs and either has just fertilized them, fertilizes them in the process, or is they are fertilized right after the male gets them. The males will then hold the eggs either on the tail or the abdomen, what is known as tail brooding or trunk brooding. These groups have been given names. The tail brooders are known as urophory, and the trunk brooders are known as gastrophory. And there are some who actually treat these as taxonomic groups. Right. Some research does seem to lean that there is a distinct separation between those who brood on the tail, those who brood on the trunk. That this hasn't evolved multiple times back and forth. That it was, this group does it this way, and this group does it that way. Exactly. And this was a big, huh, 
fact, when I was doing the research, tail brooders includes sea dragons, a bunch of pipe fish, and seahorses. Hmm. That's not the belly. That is the upper section of the tail. Oh, weird. There you go. Do we have, like, is this like a snake situation where people are like, where does the neck and the tail begin or, or end? Yeah, it, is it in front of or behind the anus? Huh, where's the anus on a, on a horse, seahorse? Above what we've always thought was their belly button. What? <laughs> I have another picture for yeah, you. Yeah, please. What? That's where the anus of a... Oh, I see it in that yeah. picture. Yeah. That that's so when the brood area is highlighted, it makes it much clearer that the tail is start. The base of the tail is where the dorsal fin is. Yes. And the the bump is the end of the body. And then the second half of the bump is just the brood area. There you go. Oh, this is the biggest revelation in this episode so far. Seahorse anuses are not where I thought they were. I had the exact same. I would have thought they were at the base of the bump. Mm -hmm. But according to that diagram, they are in the middle of the bump. Yeah. I saw their the like, belly bump. Th they're split into tail brooders and trunk brooders. All oh, right, so like seahorses with the trunk and everyone else. Right, the belly and then like way down on the tail. And they're like, no, 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 <laughs> no, you silly. <laughs> but then there are a number of pipefish which do carry it on the belly. Actually, are carrying the it on actual the belly. abdomen, like yes. where their organs are. Yes. Wow. It's so All bizarre. right. You've officially blown my mind. It's so cool. I didn't expect to be that surprised. In this. <laughs> also, while we're talking about mind-blowing things, I was letting you... I didn't want to interrupt you. Yes. But let's just back up a second. A number of them, the eggs are fertilized inside the male? Yeah, like the male like fertilizes them upon receiving. That's so <laughs> weird. The, it's internal fertilization, but it's intern inside the male. Yeah. That's so weird. The, the brooding gets so crazy. So there are basically kind of five levels of male, of, of how extreme they get with the male brooding. The first one is just eggs glued on, just here, hold on to these, squish. And there's nothing protecting. There's no structure, really. Like alligator pipefish have kind of a flattened, you know, landing platform area. And that, that that's about it. Okay. And so you squish them on and then... All right, you carry these until they start popping. Right. And you're just holding on to the eggs until they're ready. Exactly. You have the next level up, which has individual membrane kind of compartments for the eggs. Is this like those frogs that yeah. have the holes in their back where mm -hmm. the eggs sit? Kind of like that. It's that sort of, you're inside my skin a little bit, but okay. each egg gets a pocket. Cool. <laughs> the next step up is protecting it with a pouch or pouch plates where you're kind of cupping it. Mm -hmm. Some of them will use their pelvic fins. Some of them will use uh, structures that kind of fold around either side of the eggs. And are, you know, I'm I'm hugging the eggs. Yeah, I'm not quite enclosing them, but I'm hugging them. These can then come together and close two folds on either side, closing in the middle to a pouch, a closed, fully encased pouch, which is what we see in seahorses. But seahorses are specifically given a step five because their pouch is notably more extreme and complex than everyone else's. The tail brooders are by far the more diverse. The trunk brooders are less diverse and trunk brooders only show one through three. They only get as complex as kind of hugging the eggs. Okay. So they never get a full pouch. Mm -mm. Whereas the tail brooders, it sounds like are marsupial fish. Yeah, basically they, and they'd still range. They still have ones that just glue to okay. compartments, to hugging, to pouch, to seahorses. Right. <laughs> Seahorse level. Oh, yeah. Within the pouch, they are surrounded by what I've seen described as a pseudo-placenta. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> it does the job for the eggs of gas exchange, waste removal, and osmoregulation. Whoa. It is basically acting like a uterus. Yeah, it's a womb. It's a womb. That the a fish has developed. Yes. In the males. Absolutely. And this is actually messed up what term we give because the typical oviparity and viviparity egg laying and live bearing are often taken very strictly in those terms right it's eggs are live or nothing yes and very often the strict definition of viviparity for live bearing specifies that it's the female reproductive tract that you are right. developing within the female so technically the male seahorses don't count 
So what do we call it? I've seen some that suggest pseudo viviparity, which is not often used. Sure. Which is why male pregnancy is so often the term used. Yeah. Because because it, it is pregnancy. We don't really have... Well, because pregnancy basically by definition happens in a uterus. Yes. It involves a uterus and ovaries and those kinds of structures which are specific to a female reproductive system. Absolutely. So yeah, when it's happening in a male animal, we don't have a word for that. Yep. But yet there's so many parallels between the male seahorse form of pregnancy and other viviparous species that are female pregnant that it's really hard not to kind of treat it on a similar level. Yeah, and I guess we should be clear that the males, what is basically happening, and if you've seen a seahorse in a documentary, I'm sure you've seen this, that the eggs are held in this pouch in this male womb, and then they hatch and the babies come out. Yes. So this isn't like we're releasing the eggs, and you know, holding them and letting them cook a little bit and then laying eggs. Yep. It's babies come out of this pouch after they have fully developed and are done. So it really is very much like live birth. And... Often it's kind of portrayed as, yeah, you're given the eggs and then you hold them till they hatch. But more is going on because they are taking care of waste removal and Mm -hmm. things like that. There are even seahorses that provide nutrition. That's so cool. That they will pump nutrients and lipids into the pouch to be absorbed by the young. So that is not just holding the eggs till they hatch and then you let the babies go. You are caring for and nurturing and growing the eggs yeah in this pseudo placenta the same way that reproductive systems do it in females in animals that have live birth absolutely or things like live birth because we we said before it's often treated as one or the other but it's not no and we've talked about there's all sorts of in-betweens there's a huge gradient but among us viviparous amniotes there's actually even genetic similarities Oh, I bet there are. (laughs) In the pouch of a seahorse and the placenta, there are similar genetic uh, molecular structures and and coding going on. So it is a almost one-to-one comparison of what this pouch is doing. An utterly remarkable feat of convergent evolution. And And with that, we will also see sex reversals in certain groups of signathids where the females are the ones competing for males. And the females are the ones that are being a bit more aggressive and more brightly colored. Gotcha. So the roles are a bit different. Yes. So typically we think about males being the ones engaged in all the competition. Yes. And that's why male fish and male birds are typically the more colorful, the more showy, the more active, the more aggressive. Because they're the ones doing all the dances or the fighting or whatever it is they're doing. But there are animals. We talked about this with hyenas. Yep. We've talked about this with birds. Where, for one reason or another, it's switched. Mm -hmm. And the females are the ones doing more of that kind of sexual activity and courtship and things like that. This makes total sense that that would be a a reason for that to happen. Yes. Some signathids show that reversal. Not all. It's actually quite diverse even then. The type of mating and relationships varies throughout the group. Even though they all show male brooding, how it is handled and how the two the male and the female interact is still very diverse so now the question of where did these weirdos come from unfortunately the question's kind of hard to answer because the fossil record is not particularly great and for some groups it is quite poor but some of these especially seahorses which we'll get into after the break their fossil record is not good So we do not have a clear definite of, oh yes, you can see the transition from fishy fish to signathid fish. But we do have some molecular estimates and are able to get some ideas of when the group likely diverged and when they likely showed up. Phylogenetic reconstruction seems to support that signathids diverged from other ray-finned fish about not quite 50 million years ago, 48-ish. That is more than I would have guessed. Yeah. 50 million years ago, if that's an accurate dating for when they split off the others, puts them around the same time as the splitting of rhinos and tapers and ho- actual horses. Yes. <laughs> and land horses. <laughs> yeah, this places them in the Eocene, and fossils do seem to support that. We'll get okay. into more detail, but yeah, they have been around for the better part 
of 50 million years. Cool. Now, this would have been a pipefish. Right. This is the whole significant group. Yeah. So this would have been a pipefish-shaped thing. The ancestral shape would have been that, and that's what the earliest ones are looking like. So we aren't seahorses yet, but it is thought that this divergence was likely triggered or at least affected by the Paleocene, the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. Episode 103. Yes. This was a period of high temperatures. This happened around the same time, slightly earlier, like 55 million years ago, and would have had a significant effect on the temperature of the oceans. And so it's thought that it sinks up and would have had an effect on fish life and that it could very likely be one of the triggering aspects for this extreme divergence into this weird group. Something changed in resource availability or food options or something like that that allowed for this divergence. And they made the point that if things shifted in the ocean, considering how specific the lifestyle of Signathids is, they could have been affected especially heavily if they're having very specific habitats or feeding sites or prey or whatever, you know, their lifestyle is quite unique among fish. So if things shift, it could have been a bigger effect on them. And that may have been why we see this group originate during this time. Yeah. While Signathids show up quite a bit ago, uh, we don't get seahorses until about 18 million years ago. Okay. So they show up much later in the group's history, and our earliest evidence of them, of hippocampus specifically, is Miocene, 18 million years ago. And that's that's about as much information as we really have, because the seahorse record is not great, Mm -hmm. and they're fairly recent. So there's a lot of unknowns as to their origins and how they first got to be the way they were. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about it as we go through the fossils and evolution of this group, but that's that's really, that's as much <laughs> as I could find for the proposed origins of seahorses. Yeah, well, if they've been around for just under 20 million years, then that makes seahorses part, uh, basically part of our modern groups of animals. Yep. Because that means that they've been around for about the same time period as familiar groups of things like Cats and dogs and pinnipeds and even our modern snakes show up relatively. The diversity of vipers and stuff like that is relatively recent along that time scale. So that's a, that's a very interesting note that seahorses are really a very modern thing. Yeah, what I did not expect going into this. I Like we were saying at the beginning of just assuming most fish groups have thousands of members, I also had kind of just assumed that there were ancient like truly ancient seahorses. Cause yeah. it's just like, yeah, why wouldn't there have been you know, seahorses are younger than grasslands. Yeah. Which is very strange. It's, <laughs> it's odd. They're an odd group. Now, as far as the origination of Signathids and the history of Signathids, there are some potential insights. One is according to molecular data, it seems that they likely had a Western Pacific origin. Okay. And then invaded the Atlantic on Two occasions, it seems, based on the relations of different signathid groups. So when we say molecular data, we're talking about genetics, typically, maybe also protein studies, but studying the patterns of change through time in their genetic structure and tracing that to particular body shapes or lifestyles or locations. Exactly. And according to the estimates, it seems like it was likely that one group got to the Atlantic before the closure of the Tethian Seaway, and then one made it after that point so two different times that signathids went from pacific to atlantic okay with so there are three distinct lineages according to molecular data gotcha Mm -hmm. okay based on different dispersal events in the past yes 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 cool but there is also some support for a deep evolutionary divergence between the tail and the trunk brooders Oh, so it's not just, like we were saying, not just a back and forth recent thing. It Mm -hmm. might be a deep split. Yeah, because some things described the urophory and the gastrophory, the the tail and the trunk brooders, as being kind of uh, uh, polyphyletic groups that it's just, these are just describing where the eggs are, not actually groups within signathids. Right, not actually related groups uh, taxonomically. But maybe. But maybe they are. There is some support. 
If these are distinct groups, the tail brooders have about 240 species and the trunk brooders have 56. Okay. So much more on the tail brooder side. According to one paper I read, basically every molecular tree, so every taxonomy set up by molecular data, supports this. Okay. In the recent studies, at least. But the current subfamily and setup with the Signathinae and the Hippocampinae completely go against it. So the current taxonomy really disagrees. So some current researches treat the brooding distinction as the the taxonomy. I found lots that were like, yep, there's two subfamilies. Tail brooders, trunk brooders. And then others that would stick with the previously mentioned ones, the Signathinae and the Hippocampinae. So that we may see that shift as research continues. But there is some evidence that there is a distinct evolution evolutionary divergence between those two brooding styles interesting but to answer a lot of these questions we're going to need solid fossil data so let's talk about that after this break let's do it In past episodes, we've discussed a bit about what attributes tend to make a group fossilize well or not preserve as well. Yeah. You know, there's certain features, what your body's made out of, where you live, how big are you, your lifestyle can even affect it. The Signathids have an interesting combination. They are fairly small. Yes, which doesn't always do good for fossilization. Exactly. But they are all very bony. Yeah, and hard bodies tend to fossilize pretty well. Yeah, those dermal skeletons, those subdermal armored rings are bony. They are bone, so they can fossilize just as well as their skeleton or their skull or any part of them. So when they are preserved, they can actually be preserved quite well in those fossil sites and records. But they do not always preserve well in some groups preserve significantly poorly Mm. so it's kind of a mixed bag as to how well this group is represented some have a decent representation others not so much overall though it is not amazing yeah it makes me kind of think of insects yeah where like yeah your body is covered in hard parts like you have an exoskeleton there's a lot of hard bits to this body Yeah, you went with the right anatomy but this is also a very tiny, delicate animal. Also, I mean, arguably bats yeah, yeah. have a skeleton. Like they've got <laughs> bones in them, which tend to fossilize well, but bats do not fossilize well. So some situations, there are examples and areas and fossil sites that have good records of signathids. So it's not that they're just poor all the way across. Like every time we find one, it's like, oh, mm-hmm. some areas, they are well known. Other areas, not really. And certain groups Almost not at all. There's also significant, a lot of debate about the taxonomy of these fossil groups. That makes sense. Yep. There's a lot of debate about the taxonomy of the modern groups. Exactly. A lot of identification for individual lineages and species has to do with that dermal armor. Identifying the shape. Okay. Kind of like identifying teeth in mammals. Mm -hmm. You should, you can kind of tell. But as mentioned earlier, there's lots of convergence losing certain features or gaining certain features that are not all evolutionarily one lineage that multiple lineages arrived at the same adaptation and have run with it it makes it harder to find a feature and say this feature definitely means we are part of this group or this genus or this species yes so it gets a bit messy but and this is also partially because according to one of the papers i read a lot of signathid fossils are still undescribed Okay, not a lot of Signathid researchers. Yeah. That can also be a big setback. So there's lots of research to be done and evidently fossils for it to be done on, but it has not yet happened. This may have updated. There may be Signathid researchers out there that was like, that was, yes, five years ago, not now. Who are listening to this right now. Like, just you wait, my paper's coming out. And if that's the case, awesome. Keep doing it. But (laughs) send it to us when you're done. This has led to some of that taxonomic debate is a lack of research as well as the lack of fossils, as well as the unclear relationships. But we do still have fossils. In fact, our oldest fossils go back to the Eocene, 
where it was estimated that this group diverged. All right. So presumably some of the earliest cygnethids, the early pipefish-like fish. Exactly. We have not quite roughly-ish 50 million-year-old cygnethid fossils. So we do have very early members of this group if all of our data is correct that that's when they diverged. Currently, the oldest believed cygnathid fossil is Proselenostomus lessini, which is maybe not cygnathidae. It is placed as a stem lineage of cygnathidae. Okay, so closely related to the ancestors of true cygnathids. Yes. So it may be more ghost pipe fish or something related to both groups, but it is very, very close, and it is the earliest one, and I believe that was the one that is the 48 million-year-old date. Gotcha. That, that is like... The group definitely gets its origin somewhere right around here. Part of its definition for the group is that it's missing pelvic fins. Uh, okay. It was also listed as missing dorsal fins, though, which Whoa. is weird. Yeah. So I I tried to find the research specifically on this, and I couldn't confirm what that is what that means or would entail. Right. Is, did it not fossilize? Yeah. Or did you not have... Was this like an early experiment evolutionarily of trying what if we lost these fins (laughs) what if we just got rid of all of them (laughs) so huh the majority of these early eocene cygnathids are found in northern italy there's six different species known from this region from five different definite lineages it seems none of which can be for sure connected to any of our extant genuses any of our modern groups yeah we can't definitely say oh this is a ancestor or related to this group but They are cygnathids. So we actually do have, you know, a little handful of species from these early years. Okay. Also, northern Italy. That's a cool claim to fame to have in your country. The fact that there is somewhat high diversity among cygnathids at this time suggests that they could have likely originated even earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, how much earlier? I, it's, you know, it's hard, that's hard to right. say. But they had time potentially to diversify into a wide variety already. Exactly. So that origin date might get pushed back as we find more or able to hopefully find, you know, the, the earliest earliest. Mm-hmm. We'll find out they arrived on that asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Make way. They puttered down on their dorsal fins. <laughs> and... <laughs> Just all of them pushing the asteroid out of orbit. <laughs> But as far as fossils go, Cygnathus, the genus of pipefish, is the most common. That is by far the most Hmm. common Cygnathid fossil. That's convenient. Yeah, right? (laughs) And they are known from at least 11 different fossil species. Wow. This is the majority of pipefish fossil species, which means most pipefish fossils are in the same genus as modern Cygnathus. Mm -hmm. Like this is a modern genus. So this genus has been around for a while. The oldest fossil is in the early Oligocene and they have an almost uninterrupted fossil record from then to now. Wow. Actually pretty good. Actually pretty good fossil (laughs) record of this group. Yeah. Cool. We see their highest diversity in the Miocene from the Mediterranean Sea area of the world where there are at least four Cygnathus species present at 15 million years ago. Okay, interesting. So yeah. Whole four of them. Pretty good diversity considering Not the rest of the fossils. Bad for pipefish. Right? <laughs> and there are fossils of Cygnathus acus, which is an extant species from the Pliocene of Italy. So we have fossil records of some of our modern groups, at least one of our modern groups of this pipefish group. This is the kind of situation that makes me wonder, especially with the sort of long-lived genera and long-lived species, if these are situations where if we get more fossils down the road, we'll be able to do more specific identifications and find out that there is more diversity within those groups than we thought. Yep, yep, absolutely. I've seen this happen with other fossil groups where we thought that genus was very long-lived until we got more information and found out that, oh, actually, there are a handful of different genera. This is actually five groups across that time. Yeah, which I bring up because it sounds like the taxonomic situation, right? Exactly Mm. precise (laughs) identifications and relationships is regularly in flux for this group of fish. So it's always exciting to be looking at what is known about a particular group with the little caveat that this is changing. As time goes on, we're always learning more and refining that understanding. Absolutely. 
and many of the papers I would go through would have a line of more research on these topics would be great. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Please somebody study fossil pythons. Yes. Yes. There are some weirdos. Uh, now, not super weird, but there was one that was noted for being a standout, an oligocene pipefish that had a fully developed anal fin. Whoa. Whoa. By its anus, which I assume was in its ear. <laughs> <laughs> It'll never tell. <laughs> this is a new genus, which I'm going to let David read. <laughs> uh, probably Shechagnathus. <laughs> ah, cool. Polypterus. Uh, that's what I'm going with. <laughs> this is a Russian fossil. Now, the reason this is notable is all of today's pipefish and cygnathids, as far as we know, have, when the anal fin is present, and it often isn't, is itty-bitty, with just six little rays. Those are, the, like, the structures that support fish fins of this kind. Teeny-tiny, basically vestigial. This pipefish had a fully developed anal fin, equal to size of the dorsal fin, and basically on the opposite side of it. So it had effectively a dual dorsal fin. Oh, cool. And I, I don't know if they were able to get any information about whether that would also be used for m movement, for undulating and yeah. swimming. Are they both fluttering on top and bottom at the same time? I sure hope so. Yeah, that'd be the best. This is also enough difference to justify actually a new subfamily of pipefish. Oh. And if, it, if the anal fin wasn't enough, it also has a caudal fin. So it's tail, tail fin. fin, yeah, which means it likely did not have a prehensile tail, but it, it just had all the fins. What a bizarre group of fish that it having those <laughs> fins is weird. And we're like, wow, look at you having fins. What are you doing, showing off? <laughs> On the way to the Oscars. <laughs> and now we can talk about the fossil record of seahorses, hippocampus, which is basically not there. Mm, that's uh, a shame. I saw it in multiple papers, nearly absent. Wow. We do not have much of a record of seahorses. There's really not much. I found a couple of different claims to which were the earliest and longest known. So I, But I found a mention of Hippocampus Hippocampus, the short-snouted seahorse, fossil Pleistocene, member of that extant species. Right, that's a living species. Here's a fossil of it. Yep, there was Hippocampus... Ramelosus from the lower Pli Pliocene in northern Italy, which is, according to that paper, basically a synonym for the extant species Hippocampus gutilatus. So once so again, an, probably an, the same species yep. that we have today. Those, according to what I found, were basically the only known seahorses for quite some time. There have been others found, but all extant, all fossils of extant groups. Only recently were two extinct groups of seahorses found in Russia, two Miocene species. These are Hippocampus somaticus and Slovinicus. They do still show similarities to modern groups. Uh, Somaticus is very similar to the flat-faced seahorse, and the Slovinicus is very similar to our pygmy seahorses of today. Okay. So st still not like super weird, unrecognizable. They are similar looking. But fossil seahorses. But fossil seahorses, and as far as I was able to find, the only known extinct species in the seahorse fossil record. Interesting. Every other fossil connects to an extant group. A living group. That is really, makes for a tough situation for paleontologists, because <laughs> it means that most of what we have to work with to unravel their evolutionary history is the modern seahorses. Yes. This also, these also are the oldest seahorse fossils. These are Miocene, 15 million years old-ish. Okay. And the estimation for the origination of the group was around 18 million years old. So this fits. Mm -hmm. They're not so much older than we would have expected. Though, the distinct differences between these two does give some suggestion that the group could have originated even before the Miocene. Right. Once again, with enough time to diversify into the, that much difference between two different species. Which does line up with evidently some of the more recent molecular clock estimates for the group. Okay. So there are some that seem to indicate they could be even older overall. But there are some really cool things about these two fossils. Like, they actually gave us some interesting insights. One of the aspects is how they were fossilized. They were 
preserved in what the paper called MOS laminas or moss laminas, which were areas of mass occurrences of seahorses. Whoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> Little groupings of typically young seahorses. Oh, a little little school, mm-hmm. a little herd, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, a little herd of foals. <laughs> These were bedding planes, so you know, like layered bedding, and when in you the sediment s- in the sediment when you split it apart, where there are up to ten juveniles, that's what considered a mass occurrence. Huh. This is unusual among seahorse fossils. No other seahorse has been found in these kind of groupings, so that's exciting. And they were able to potentially draw two lifestyle conclusions from these occurrences. One had to do with the type of behavior the young showed right after birth. Seahorses are not good swimmers. We've been over that. So not to beat a dead seahorse, but not good. (laughs) (laughs) Typically, if they are spread far and wide, it's because a storm Right. grabbed them as an adult <laughs> they had help but babies sometimes can be quite widespread because they're smaller they can go with the currents okay and some seahorses do have a planktonic beginning to their life they are born and then float among the sea until they finally settle down and start grabbing stuff with their tail but not all some do not have that planktonic stage and immediately settle down mm-hmm. and don't travel very far the fact that we have these groupings suggests that these seahorses were not the planktonic variety. Right. They settled down quickly. Exactly. So at least the Sarmaticus seahorse, the the Hippocanus Sarmaticus, doesn't seem to have floated its babies off, that they settled down, and that's why we have these groupings. And that they likely grabbed onto, like, a piece of floating plant, maybe. And then that floating plant made its way into the basin where all of the sediment has been preserved and gathered, and the anoxic... Or hypoxic conditions of the water there uh, suffocated them and killed them all at once. Mm. And so that's why we have these little mass burials. Ah. (laughs) Tragic, (laughs) but great. Yeah. As always, horrible tragedy, good paleontology. Yep. The other bit of inference is uh, pretty obvious and straightforward when you think about brood size. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's very likely if they were settling down after birth that you'll get a group of closely related seahorses for those non-plagic species. If these groups are that situation of a brood or a part of a brood settling down together, then we can say that at least they had brood sizes of 10. Okay, interesting. That's unusual. I wouldn't have expected to get that kind of information from fossil seahorses, especially considering all of the emphasis we've put on the fact that we don't get a lot of them. Yeah. So lots of papers have been taught, like almost every paper yeah. after this will be like, also these two, like these two big deal. Yep. Because <laughs> they're really, really exciting. <laughs> now, how does this consider to modern brood sizes? On average, you'll see seahorses typically giving birth between one to 300 babies. Okay. And uh, when they give birth, they like sneeze them out. Oh, yeah. Well, because it's contractions. They have to push the babies out the, of the pouch. Oh. I've heard it described as contractions and evidently... They are violent and tough muscle movements, so it really is a contraction to squeeze all those babies out of the pouch. (laughs) Interesting. But they can have brood sizes all the way up to at least one case of 2,000 from a Pacific seahorse or the giant seahorse. Wow. Lots of space for babies. Oh, yeah. Hippocampus engines, which I always like because it makes me think of engine from Lost World. Oh, sure. Yep. Every, the first time I saw it, I was like, well, I'll never forget that one. Yep, this is the seahorse, the, the rival seahorse. Yeah, the, the ones that really shouldn't have been given control <laughs> of everything. But smaller seahorses can have brood sizes of like 3 to 16, like itty bitty. So okay. they may we may only be getting part of the brood, but it could also be a small brooding species. Yeah. Now, that's about all the information I could find on fossils for this group. I mean, without just listing species names and just... This one was found in Italy. This right. one was found in the the Caucasus. This was found in Russia. I could not find much else because the fossil record is not particularly robust. But there has been lots of research into the evolution of this group, uh, both using fossils, but also looking at what we have today and trying to figure out why are you the way you are. Mm-hmm. So evolutionary studies are abound for signathids because they're so weird. 
and there's so many interesting features to their lifestyle and their anatomy that can help us look into other aspects of evolution. One of the biggest questions about their anatomy for seahorses specifically is, why are you shaped like a horse? Why do you look this way? Why? Why have you done this? <laughs> and there's been a few different studies into what could the advantages be? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't, unfortunately, we do not have the record to watch you bend into a seahorse shape. Right. We don't have all of the steps in the fossil record that it took to get to modern seahorses. We might be able to answer the question of why. Mm -hmm. What were the advantages? How did being shaped like an utter weirdo help you? Why is this good? Yes, exactly. <laughs> One thing we've looked at is other modern groups that are similar to seahorses, like the pygmy pipe horse, but do not have that posture. And one of the convenient things about it being a recently evolved group is that we may still see some of the transitional forms preserved in close relatives. Right. That this is not an ancient group where all of those transitional you know, forms have been lost to the fossil record. These, they've only been around for not quite 20 million years, so... Well, this has a situation like we've discussed with snakes, mm -hmm. where it's the, you're not the only legless lizards. Yes. We've got lizards that don't have legs and lizards that have tiny legs. We've got all sorts of representatives of the stages you might have gone through to arrive at where you are today. Precisely. So it's not to say that pygmy pipe horses are a transitional form between pipefish and seahorse but they may represent a similar body style that we would have seen in the early ancestors of seahorses. Mm -hmm. So once again, these are the ones that look like a sh kind of straightened out seahorse, but they swim horizontally. So that may be what we could picture early seahorses looking like. Molecular dating seems to indicate that these two taxa diverged in the late Oligocene. And one of the intriguing notes about this time is that in the West Pacific, the Indo-West Pacific, there were a number of shifts in the tectonic sh layout that promoted an increase in shallow water areas, which are really great environments for seagrass, which we do see an increase of, an expansion of seagrass habitats, which could be why seahorses stood up to hide among the grass to hide in that now new vertical habitat. Okay. Well, and it sounds like there are a lot of other fish in this extended group that are already in the habit of swimming kind of vertically. Yep. So it could be that this is already something that is a habit and it is a benefit if you're doing this because it helps you camouflage in all these wonderful environments. So you could then, if you've got a lot more of that environment, it is a rich ground for these kinds of fish to evolve different strategies for coping in those habitats. Precisely. And the seahorse has an advantage over the fact that it's not facing up or facing down while it's swimming vertically. It is facing forward. Right. It's changed the body so that it can face forward while still being vertical in orientation. Exactly. So there is some thought that maybe the fact that we see a similarly shaped group, but that's still horizontal diverging from our seahorses at a time when the habitats that seem to really benefit being shaped like a seahorse became more prolific in the area of the world that we think Signathids originated could very well be part of the reason, part of the push evolutionarily to stand up and look like a horse a little bit. But that's not the only advantage potentially for them to be shaped like a horse. Another study looked at the biomechanical advantage of having a head that was angled for hunting. Oh. Yeah. So, once again, backtracking a little bit. Seahorses, carnivorous. Signathids are carnivorous. And they hunt with that really quick suction feeding. They move the head toward prey and then suck it in. But the suction only works at a very close distance because they don't have that giant gaping grouper mouth to just vacuum up entire fish everything that's in front of me. just whatever i decide is going in my belly this is a very close range suction so they need to get the face there which is what that pivot comes in of moving my head towards it really quick and then hiccuping it in and these movements can be really quick as mentioned uh, it's actually controlled by tendons that release the elastic pressure that store it and release it to make the quick movement Ooh. so the movements can be 
quite a bit less than a second. The one I found was 0. 0.005 wow. seconds speed for that head pivot. We see this kind of feeding strategy in many synaphids, and when it was observed in pipefish, it was noticed that when they moved the head up to grab prey, there was notable downward movement of the trunk, the main section of the body, in accordance to the upward movement of the head. Right. The head snaps up and the body accordingly goes down. Yeah. Just that... a physics relationship. You're a lever. Precisely. As they put it, it is the law of conservation of momentum. It's... Yes. So it, your body moves every time you move the head up. It was hypothesized potentially that having the head at a more extreme angle would fight that momentum a bit. Because your body is not in line, so it's not moving as a lever anymore. It's moving like a hinge. Yeah. And in fact, they found that, yes, seahorses show less body movement when they strike. So it is a more efficient strike. And they're able to strike further away from where their eyes are because they can hinge the head in a movement way so that they're not moving the head with the body like a pipefish is. It's more of a strike. So they can actually target prey in a wider range than other signaphids. So this bizarre head shape might actually s sort of unexpectedly make them more efficient predators. Absolutely. Whilst also maybe helping them be better hiders, better yeah. camouflaged in the environments that they tend to occupy. Man, we better watch out for horses. Oh yeah, it's they're just they're just waiting. <laughs> they're <laughs> waiting to pounce. Vacuum you up. <laughs> the other section, though, that a bunch of research is put into is the evolution of male pregnancy. I can I believe it. I want to know the evolution yes. of male pregnancy. This is a huge question because a weird, yes. like so so unique to this group in the way they're doing it, but also it is a great chance to study how does brooding and sex role reversals evolve, you yeah, know. And how does pregnancy evolve in general? Exactly. And it's such a weird feature because I can imagine all sorts of benefits for developing that pouch and developing a place that nourishes the, the young and the eggs and all that stuff. But all of those advantages seem to me to already be accomplished by the females doing it? Absolutely. So why why did this evolve in the males? So this has been looked at in quite some detail. First and foremost, male care of eggs is actually not that uncommon, especially in fish. Yeah. One of the papers noted that there's at least 22 individual evolutionary examples of solely male cared for eggs. Yeah, we, we think of parental care as a mammal and bird thing mostly, mm -hmm. but fish are very good at parental care in many cases. Yes, and in many of them, it's the male that mm -hmm. guards the nest. The female lays it, the male fertilizes them, and then the male stays and guards and protects and even cares for, you know, fanning them, getting rid of algae, stuff like that. And that's actually pretty common among our ray-finned fish. There are a couple of ideas as to why this is so common and how this could evolve so many times. Uh, one is just that the last the last one to interact with the eggs gets stuck with them. Right. <laughs> and the female lays them down first. The male automatically is the last one that has to interact because they fertilize them. Yep. And the female's already long gone. Yep. <laughs> and there's a selective pressure for a parent to take care of these eggs. If it benefits the survival of the young to have a parent guard them... They called it as being left in the cruel bind. <laughs> so it could just be that. It's also been hypothesized that if the male sticks around to protect the young, they also can increase the chances that they're the parent. Since external fertilization, which most fish do, can have multiple parents potentially. As sperm mixes in the water and multiple males try to fertilize one patch of eggs, if you're already planning to guard it, you can guarantee... That right. this batch are your kids. If a male shows up and then stays there, it can prevent other males from fertilizing, thus increasing, you know, decreasing competition from other males. Exactly. And their offspring. We also, in fish, see similar versions of brood care, of extreme on-the-body brood care. Skin brooding is not only known from signathids. Other fish keep their f eggs on their skin. There's even the example of the toads that you mentioned earlier that have those 
pockets on the back for the babies to, yep. to stay in. There are examples of this in males in some animals, like some frogs who keep it in their vocal sac and some fish who do keep the eggs on the body, but that actually is much more rare. So males protecting the eggs is not as rare. Males keeping them on their body is fairly rare. Right. It's not that this rarity could be that transferring the eggs is more of a risk than just letting the male guard the eggs. Like, that's not really a risk factor, but transferring from one body to another, there's a risk that you drop the eggs, that they don't get transferred correctly. Right. That also seems like it may take more specific conditions. Mm -hmm. It might be more difficult or more rare to adapt or have a body shape or body structures that can successfully hold on to the eggs. It also makes it harder for the male to mate with multiple females. That's true. Uh, which is one of the advantages for most male species, uh, you know, most male animals is that you can fertilize multiple batches of eggs or multiple females mm -hmm. very easily. But if you're now the one taking on the brooding onto your body, then you're, you've switched the traditional role that the female is usually filling. Right. So yeah, now females have a wider choice and wider opportunities for mating. Exactly. So that could be a selective pressure against the male to do that. Potentially. The reason all this is important is it brings up the question of what was the ancestral brooding situation of Cygnathids since they do both. The males take care of the eggs and have it on the body. So were they, which ancestral state do we think is most likely? Now, the next close, most closely related group are the ghost pipefish that we mentioned earlier. They are skin brooders, but the female does it. Okay. So... They have the skin, they carry the eggs with them, but the male is not involved. The male does not brood the eggs, and the female is the one carrying them, so he's not. He's also not protecting the nest. It's very Cygnathid, but female. Most researchers do not think that that is the ancestral state of Cygnathids. Because transitions from female care of the eggs, not even just on the skin, but just female care of the eggs, to male care of the eggs, is very rare to non-existent. Gotcha. Strictly female care transitioning to strictly male care, that really doesn't exist as far as we see. So it's not likely that female skin brooding is the ancestral state for Cygnathids. Mm -hmm. In fact, male care most commonly evolves from groups that have external fertilization, you know, so lay the eggs, fertilize the eggs, with no parental care. Interesting. That's the most common. So the most common is that there's no care and then... When one of the parents decides, hey, we should probably protect these things, <laughs> it's the male okay. in those groups that show male care. So most likely ancestral Cygnathids were externally fertilizing their eggs and then not taking care of them. And then eventually it became the male's job to care for the eggs, protect them, and eventually leading down the line to brooding. Now, the transitioning of the eggs is actually a very key part of their mating. It's often very complex because it's very important that it happens correctly. And so there's a courtship that goes on with many Cygnathids to coordinate the male and female, the mating pair, so that when the eggs are transitioned, the female releases them on time and the male picks them up on time. Mm -hmm. If either of those are off time, they drop the eggs and that batch is just, just ruined. Another group of cousins, the sea moths or dragonfish, which have very cool. Big wing-like pectoral fins. I don't even know what those look like. Right? But the, just the name is very cool. Big wing-like pectoral fins. Still a skinny little snout. Okay. These are more free-swimming. They're more fish-shaped. They're related to the overall group and the ghost pipe fish. These show, very often, monogamous, so mating pairs. But they still are breeding and ex fertilizing externally. They're not carrying the eggs. But... When they spawn, when the female releases the eggs and the male releases his sperm, they do it by swimming in a pair up the water column and releasing at the top. Okay. So it's a coordinated release. So exactly. synchronized swimming. Yes. A lot of Cygnathids do that. Okay. A lot of Cygnathids swim in a pattern, in a dance, basically, up the water column, and the egg transfer happens at the top of the swim. So it's thought that maybe ancestors were were spawning in a similar way, which means since that's it's a close spawning, it's not I'm just releasing all of our, you know, we're just releasing all of our eggs and sperm into the water or that we're laying them down. It's a very close association between the release of both. 
this connects the male also to the release of the eggs very closely. Right. And it's easy to see how that could just become closer and closer over time. Exactly. So how do we start getting the male to carry them? Mm -hmm. Many nest building fish have sticky eggs. Yeah. <laughs> to stick the eggs to places. To, to coral or to whatever they're laying eggs on. Exactly. This is acts as a cement to build their nest and keep the eggs from floating away or from getting dispersed. So it is not much of a stretch to think that you just start sticking them to the male. Oh, yeah. And you just glue them to the male's belly instead of the rock. Yeah, so that, that courtship is just getting closer and closer and closer until you're bumping bellies and the eggs are sticking. Yes. <laughs> and it could have been that they still had that nesting behavior or they had the glue for some other reason. But once it's on the male, it is not hard to then picture how we go through those five stages. Right. It starts as just sticking on, and then as it becomes more beneficial over time to really hold on to them, having special pockets for the eggs, holding on to them with special flaps, having a pouch, now with that selective pressure carrying things further, it becomes very easy to see how that could progress. Absolutely. And some signathids today do have sticky eggs. Whether that's individually evolved or ancestral, that's harder to say. Now, one really interesting part of this conversation is actually what are the results of these different levels of male brooding on the species that show them? You know, these are blatantly more and more complex ways to hold on the eggs and care for the eggs. So what does that entail for those species? Basically due to the fact that the males with the very simple brooding of just gluing it to a patch on the belly are spending much less energy on brooding those eggs. Mm. So there's often been the hypothesis that we would expect to see particular trends in the less and more invested brooding styles. That the more invested, you know, energy-wise, but also parental care-wise with the extreme brooding pouches, that we would also expect to see an increased frequency in the male-female sex reversals, mm -hmm. that as the males take on more and more dedicated and invested roles in caring for the brood, that the females would be more likely to take on the typical male roles of other animals, competing for males, showing off, you know, defending their males or what have you. But in fact, we don't see that as a constant trend. So we do see sex role reversals where females show what we typically consider to be often male-like traits. But it is not consistent with the brooding patterns. There's actually evidence of multiple shifts among sex role reversals throughout the groups. Interesting. With seemingly no connection to how those groups brood. In fact, what the connection seemed to be more to was whether they were polygamous or monogamous. Polygamous mating patterns seem to coordinate positively with sex role reversals. That right. if they had multiple partners, that's when... Females seem to take on those more competitive, more aggressive, more showy roles. While monogamous groups seem to not really show sexual reversal. That, I, if, that, that makes some sense because yeah. you're not competing for multiple mates. Precisely. So it had more to do with how many other signathids you're mating with mm -hmm. than how they're holding on to the eggs. That's a fascinating thing to observe. Well, it, it's notable to point out how complex their mating styles are uh, at the aquarium we had a whole hall of signathids pipefish and leafy sea dragons and a bunch of different seahorses and they were trying to mate the leafy sea dragons because leafy sea dragons are incredibly endangered there are multiple breeding programs around the world trying to figure out how to get them to breed in human care so that hopefully we can help the population by releasing them back into the wild and no one's been successful yeah, they, not yet. They only, yeah, not yet. And it makes sense as soon as you hear why, what they need to breed. First, they do the dance. They swim up the water column and they transfer at the top, which means you need a deep habitat right. for them to swim far enough up. They also do that during full moons when the tide is highest. So it's especially deep. <laughs> so they will only do it once a month. You have one chance a month to sync things up and get it right for them to try to breed. And then you have to wait until next month when it doesn't work. And that's it. And ours would swim, but they'd never transfer the eggs correctly. They literally have to do a special dance and a special ritual on a night of a full moon. Yep. Weird. 
On the flip side, we also had alligator pipefish, and those just pumped out babies. <laughs> it's like every month you'd walk in and you'd just see a bunch of little sk- spaghetti strings floating around the water. And it's like, oh, they gave birth again. Oh. <laughs> I so, guess the, the sea dragons just don't like doing it in those tanks. No, it is. It's just not conducive. So their mating is very, can be very complex to not complex at all. Alligator pipefish also just glue it to the belly. They are trunk brooders. The sleafies are tail brooders, but it's also just glued as far as I know. Just okay. externally held. I don't think they have like a special pouch like structure. So even then, similar Levels on compl- of complexity of the brooding also do not denote the behavior. So it's it's really crazy. It's seahorses and their kin, their relatives, are a fascinating group. And I already knew that mm-hmm. before this episode. I knew that seahorses were weird and cool. I knew that pipefish were weird and cool, sea dragons. I didn't expect the level of reproductive diversity. Yeah. Of just all this variation in how they're reproducing and what their rituals and their behaviors are and how they're caring for the babies. That is a very interesting feature of their lifestyle for them to have just gone in a dozen different directions on and about a dozen different combinations. Well, and especially since you're already doing something weird, but you're already doing male brooding. That's... And you already look weird. Yes. It's like you're doing a bunch of things. There are a lot of animals where it's like, yeah, this one looks like all of its cousins, but it has this weird behavior. Yes. Seahorses are like, we the, the shape is weird. The lifestyle is weird. The structure of the body is weird. Also male brooding. Also this weird courtship stuff. Because yeah. they arrived on the ash. Yes, it's that. And so we have all this weird stuff and we're all doing it differently. Yes. <laughs> it's like, and we're shaped this way and we're shaped this way and we're shaped this way. And, and we, we don't agree. <laughs> so we're doing weird things and we're doing the weird things differently. It's so weird and fascinating. And what's especially exciting to me about all that weirdness and diversity is that based on what we've discussed in this episode, there's still so much we don't know. Absolutely. About their varieties, about their evolution, about their history. They're only going to get weirder. Yep. We're only going to keep... We discovered a new species of sea dragon a few years ago. We only have more fascinating things to discover about this group of animals. I just... I I so want us to find that one fossil to be like, there's a new fossil of Signathid, and it's weird. Not like you think. No, no. (laughs) Its body goes up uh, over the head like a scorpion. (laughs) It, It has made a wheel. (laughs) <laughs> and it would roll along the sea floor. <laughs> so that is going to about wrap up our discussion of this truly amazingly bizarre group. If we did not mention your favorite example of Signathid, please let us know because I there's so many that we could not have mentioned. Yes, barrage us with Signathid fun facts. Oh yeah, and oh, you give us pictures. Like if you go to an aquarium, take pictures and send them to us. Yeah, because I want to see them. <laughs> But we are not done yet. There's one category left, one section, which is our patron question. As mentioned before, we have a Patreon, and one of the rewards you get at certain levels is that you can ask us questions that we will answer here on the podcast. David, what's our question today? Today's patron question comes from Uju, who asks, How can we distinguish in the fossil record between convergent evolution of non-related species and similarities in related species. So we've talked about convergent evolution before episode 70, and we've talked, we mentioned it a bunch of times in this episode. Oh, yeah. This is the process by which unrelated species or distantly related species evolve similar features from different ancestors. Right. One of the most classic examples, birds and bats both evolve from non-flying ancestors, but different non-flying ancestors they each evolutionarily arrived at flight independently, separately. Whereas chickens and ducks are two groups that can both fly because they have the same flying ancestors, yes. early birds. So they have similar features because they're related. Birds and bats have similar features for flight independently evolved. Yeah, and convergent evolution typically deals with features that were evolved for a some survival aspect, you know, a, a function in that creature's life 
not to look like each other, which is mimicry, right. which we've Episode also done. 126. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a great question. So, and it's an important yeah. question. We talk so much about, yeah, this is ichthyosaurs and this is whatever else, convergently evolving features. But yeah, how do we know when we're looking at things that are convergent versus things that are just closely related? And it can be it can be tough, actually. There are some groups where this does really mess up how we determine who's related to two. For example, seahorses and their mm-hmm. cousins. That definitely is an example where sometimes it is very difficult, especially without the aid of genetics, to be yes. able to say, oh, yes, absolutely, these are related. Because, well, no, these look real similar. Mm-hmm. Is that because you're living similar lifestyles or is that because you're related? And this has come up with Crocs yes. as well in our discussions. The slender snouted groups show up over and over and over. And it's sometimes very hard to tell. Did you get a long snout because it's good to have a long snout? Or did you have a long snout because your ancestors had a long snout? Yes. <laughs> and with a lot of groups, we can typically determine it because, for instance, with birds and bats, even if we were just given parts of the wings, there are diagnostic, distinct features That this is, even though it's a wing, definitely a mammal. Yes. And this is something that I always like to remind people, is that when we look at anatomy of any particular species, it is typically mainly determined by the function of that feature and by ancestry. Yes. All modern birds have no teeth. Not because they wouldn't do well with teeth, but because their ancestors have no teeth. And they have not evolved their teeth back. That's a feature they've inherited from their ancestors. Mammal bones and bird bones, the structure of the skeleton, are going to have particular bird and mammal ancestral features, no matter how much they have functionally adapted to be similar to each other. Yes. The the way I kind of think about it is when it comes to, like, vehicles. You know, you can have the same design like an suv or a a truck kind of design but and i can't do this because i'm not a car person but car people can still be like yeah but that's a ford and that's a honda (laughs) and that's a toyota it's like well how can you tell well you know one the logo but also right ford makes its cars this is how they make their vehicles especially if you were to open up the hood i'm sure the engines would look distinct because they are a ford a honda blah blah Now, sometimes it's not as easy as just saying, well, yes, this animal has a crocodile-like snout, but the rest of its body is a dinosaur, so it's not a crocodile. Sometimes we have to get very particular and look at the structure of bone tissue, or especially if we have DNA evidence, we are comparing genetic evidence to say, yeah, these two species seem to have diverged a long time ago, separately and then independently come together. And like we said at the beginning, and I think this is probably the most important point, a lot of the times it's hard. A lot of the times we have a lot of trouble distinguishing these things, and it can really throw a wrench in our analyses. Well, especially when convergence happens in somewhat related groups. Like seahorses. Like seahorses. Or like crocs. Or even when we have similar mammals taking on very cat-like shapes. Yes. At, At first glance, you might be like, oh yeah, cat. And then you go, well, no. Actually, the wrist, the skull, these features don't really sync up with everything else we see in cats. Mm -hmm. So it might take a second look to really be able to determine it. Or a tenth look. Or a tenth look. And there are (laughs) definitely times where we have come back and gone, actually, we thought these both looked this way because of ancestry, but we found their ancestor. Right. (laughs) And it doesn't look like that. So it looks like both of these closely related groups came to this same anatomy separately. So in short, any example of convergent evolution should, in theory, if we have enough data, enough anatomical data, enough genetic data or whatever, have a mixture of features that evolved convergently for a similar function and ancestral features that clue us into what their ancestors actually looked like. That is in theory and in reality and practice, it can oftentimes be pretty muddy. Yes. And it's a great question because it is very important for us to keep in mind. Oh, yeah. It, it definitely is something that can sneak in without immediate notice when, when the convergence is real good. Yeah, it can get tricky. So thanks, Uju. That's a great question. Thanks, as always, to all of our patrons. 
Thanks to everyone who requested this episode. Thanks to everybody who listens to the podcast. This has been episode 136, which is a number that is made up of digits that all look like various types of signatures. Oh, there you go. Yeah, we did that on purpose. That's so, yeah. That's why we waited this. How long. many of you caught <laughs> the secret reference? Yeah. In, uh, the numbers, our numerology in our uh, episode title. Let us know when you figure out the other th- 135. <laughs> why we chose? Yeah. Each one. This is the one. This is the one where we decided to reveal that we've been doing that this entire time. Yeah, we are. Uh, I don't even have a joke for this. <laughs> We're just that clever. We are extremely clever. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you later. <laughs> I, I I can't commit to any particular bits. <laughs> we release episodes every fortnight. Join us for the next one. Bye. Bye. Cut most of that out. <laughs> <laughs>Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.